All right, so we'll start with introductions. Um, Bonnie, I'm gonna add you to our panelists here because you're one of our panelists and I know you're on mute. Um, all right, Christian Salgado. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Cristiane Salgado and I work for Vo Vocational Rehab in the Unit 21B in Boca Raton. Thanks, Cristiani. Uh, Alicia Young. Alicia, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, we could come back to you. Erica Song. Hi, it's Erica Son. I'm an attorney at Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County um, in the Education Law Project. Sorry, they're building a new deck. And so it's like a moment of silence. So I'm trying to be quick. <laughs> no problem, Erica. Thanks for coming. Um, Sue Davis, Killian. Hi, um, I'm with the Gold Coast Down Syndrome Organization. Good to see you all. Thanks, Sue. Nice to see you. Um, Jean Malacco. Hey, Jean. Jean, we can't hear you. Are you able to introduce yourself? There I am. <laughs> Jean Malaco, Family Care Fam Cafe, Family Care Council Nine. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, Jennifer Harris. Hey, Jennifer. Hi, Carrie. Jennifer Harris, Special Needs Advocate at Two One One. Um, there's a lot going on, at, but May is uh, Mental Health Month, just to get that out there. So happy mental health to everyone. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Kim Harris. Hi, my name is Kimberly Harris. I'm the intake specialist um, for vocational rehabilitation in Unit 21D. Thanks, Kim. Alicia Young. Oh, yes, no voice. Okay, sorry. Hi, Alicia. Um, let's see. Marsha Edelman. Hi, Carrie. I'm Marsha Edelman. I'm in the um, Family Care Council, Area 9. Hey, Marsha. Thank you for coming. All right. Uh, Mary Ellen Queen Looney. Hey, Mary Ellen. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all doing well. Um, uh, Carrie, if you don't mind, um, I'm with FAU Card, and if you don't mind, we've got three trainings, and I'll send you the flyers um, after the meeting. If you don't mind sharing them, they're up for availability, honoring as as Jennifer said, um, Mental Health Month, and these have to do with um, ASD and mental health. Uh, we also have a task force that meets every month. We have 300 people that participate and we offer CEUs. So um, these, um, these are opportunities you can get CEUs as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Gertha Minos. Hi, Gertha. Hello, how are you? Good. You're joining us today for the first time maybe? Yes. Oh, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Do you work with an agency or do you have a, a child with special needs? Yes, I have a child uh, that have special needs. Well, welcome. I hope that you enjoy today's meeting. Oh, I thank you. Yeah. Um, Millery, Senate. Hi, Carrie, how are you? Hi, Millery. Are we doing an introduction? Yes. Please introduce I'm, yourself, not that you need one. Good afternoon, I'm Milori Sena. I am the community liaison for the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. It's good to be here. I see you have a big group today. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm excited yes. for our panel. Me too. Matricia Falano. Patricia. Hi, good, Hi, good afternoon. Patricia Falano. I'm with the Florida Department of Health Title V Program, Maternal, Maternal Child Health. And usually Rachel is here, but she is out today. Well, thank you for coming, Patricia. And Sharon Alexander. Hey, Sharon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sharon Alexander, CEO of the Unicorn Children's Foundation. 
thrilled to announce that we have opened up our in-person programming. And so now we're doing uh, in-person virtual and hybrid. Um, but also we are hosting at the last Wednesday of every month at our Unicorn Connection Center, we're hosting a family fun night um, that's open to all ages, all abilities, everything from karaoke to arts and crafts to cookie decorating, food, refreshments. Um, it's an opportunity for the community to come in and see uh, what our plans are. So um, please share with your constituents and all of you uh, are invited to attend as well. Thanks, Sharon. Um, Shayeen Witherspoon. Hey, Shayeen. Hi, you said it right. Hi. Yes, I had to look at my email to make sure. <laughs> yes. Hi, I am Shayeen Witherspoon. I'm the Director of Community Impact at United Way. So I oversee all of our special needs investments. And it's really great to be here with all of you. Thank you for coming. Um, Raquel Mora. Hey, Raquel. Hello, how are you? It was good to see you in Jacksonville. Huh? That was great organization, great event, guys. It was amazing. Really a lot to talk, a lot to meet, a lot of new people and to find out organizations and uh, events it was really good. I'm glad I participated. So we are here, Vocational Habilitation, Business Relation, Raquel, Cove, Palma Beach Countess, some support for Brower. You know, just making the great connections right now and, uh, you know, bring some important for via costume. Sorry, my kids are in home. They are yelling. I'm going to turn off my microphone. <laughs> Thank you. And Raquel was talking about the APSI conference that was in um, close to Jacksonville uh, over a week ago. And Raquel and her business uh, liaison team did a great presentation on um, connecting businesses with employment support providers. So thank you, Raquel and your team. You did an awesome job. APSI stands for the Association for People Supporting Employment First. So if you're interested in learning more about that, that's a statewide chapter of the national organization. So thanks, Raquel. Um, Sherry Epstein. All right, you can introduce yourself in the chat if you're able to. Um, Simone Sterling. Hi, Simone. Hello, how are you? Um, I'm Simone Sterling. I'm with the Early Steps Program with Treasure Coast. I'm based in the West Palm Beach office. Awesome, thank you for coming. Um, and Tammy, you're driving in the car. I saw your note. Are you able to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tammy, Tammy. Lustig. Hi, it's so nice to see you. I'm Tammy and I'm a social worker at Elpert Jewish Family Service. And I am always happy to plug one of our free workshops. Tomorrow we've got legal planning. So if you're interested in learning about guardianship, advanced directives, special needs trusts, and the ABLE account, please feel free to Zoom with us tomorrow. And I also coordinate our live-in residential housing program. So hot topic today being housing. Um, if any of you have questions about our residential, which is located up in Palm Beach Gardens, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And Zippy Rosen. Hey, Zippy. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm Tippy Rosen. I'm the special needs community outreach worker at Ruth and Norman Rails Jewish Family Services, which is in Boca. Um, and one of our newest endeavors is we are opening up a, a therapy and family resource center, which is actually open. And it's a one-stop shop for families with special needs. We're gonna offer speech, occupational, physical therapy, ABA, we're gonna have a BCBA on staff to do um, you know, parenting stuff. We're gonna do workshops, parent workshops, my support groups for parents, grandparents, zip shops. If anyone would like to come and have a tour, just reach out to me. We would love to have you and show, show you what we've got. And we hope to start assessments next week. Very exciting. Very Thank you, Zippy. Thank I'm so you. so excited for you guys. All right. I think I got everybody. If I miss someone, please let me know. Um, what we'll do now is uh, we will jump into introductions of our panelists. Um, and Bonnie, I see you're on here. And um, Bonnie Schmidt is one of our panelists, and she's actually at a conference. Um, so my question to you, would you like to go first, Bonnie, since you're available now to share? You're on mute there. Yes, I, I appreciate that. Um, 
We're actually in New Orleans for a uh, World Candle Congress as part of our sensibilities candle um, company. So, um, but regarding SNAC, um, representing the Ideal Foundation, which is our main or, um, foundation, um, providing work, live and play opportunities for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And our biggest exciting news is we have just partnered with the Pulte Family Foundation and we will be um, building, developing a, a community for independent, affordable community, similar to um, Noah's, Noah's Landing, but much on a much smaller scale. So the first home uh, will hold about 18 residents and uh, we're in the process of um, securing the land now. We're looking anywhere from Boynton to Davie. So we're hoping to be in that area. I can't really discuss any more about that. We're in negotiations for a few um, places now, but um, we are, you know, talking to parents now and basically not, not just a waiting list, but meeting people and building them into our social programs so that, you know, we'll be able to vet them and see if they're appropriate for our program. And I apologize for all the noise, but um, we're literally in the street of New Orleans right now having lunch. So apologize for that. I'll stay on as long as I can. My battery is running down. So um, if anyone has any questions, um, I'm available right now. So we would love Bonnie. Can we hear your story from when Jessica was young, um, your daughter and growing up and kind of some of the barriers that you may have faced that led you to becoming a warrior and creating these uh, solutions for not only her, but also her friends and peers? Sure, um, Jessica's 38 right now. Um, she has um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, a seizure disorder, and um, her problems basically started when she was six weeks old and unfortunately a metabolic disorder was misdiagnosed. So. They basically, the doctors really told me they had little to no hope for her. And for those that know her, she, she's really, um, she's really succeeded so much. And, you know, throughout the years, lots of therapy, she's still at 38 going to um, physical and neurodevelopmental therapy three times a week, you know, and still working on all her skills. But when she turned 22 and had, you know, little to no options, we um, felt that we needed to start something because I, I can't leave her alone. And I, so I couldn't work unless I paid someone to be with her. So it didn't make sense. So we actually started Sensibility Candles back in 2009 as a for-profit through a small grant from um, Boat Rehab of Broward, their microenterprise department. And it's grown over the years. Um, based a lot and and through that we realized that there's so much more that they need than just a purposeful day um they really need to come home to an environment that you know they're happy with just like we want to live with our friends or our family or our husband spouses you know she wants to do everything that everybody else does but she needs help with everything so um that's when the ideal foundation came into place and it's spelled it's IDDEALfoundation.org. And um, we, we just actually um, redid our website. So you could check that out for Ideal Foundation. And we will be um, announcing more once we get the land, you know, and start the whole process of that. But, um, you know, she, she wants to move out, but obviously she can't and needs support. And I didn't want to, um, I just felt like a group home was not the right place for her. She has a lot of medical needs and um, same with Lexi, you know, um, with type one diabetes, very few places, you know, that, that, that give the programs that we want um, for kids with medical needs, you know. So that's when we started our dream of, of building an affordable community. We did look at Noah's Landing and Promises of Brevard and we are, um, we have consulted with Jack Hossick who is, the guru of, of housing for our kids. And um, thankfully we're working with him on this and he's very instrumental in this project. So um, we have like really great people on our team um, working you know, to build this. So it's gonna be very exciting, but we don't have a lot to announce yet and I will keep everyone posted, but 
the goal is within two years to have this place and uh, our entire sensibility team, you know, wants to live there. So we'll have limited space on the first, um, the first home, but we will be adding additional ones as we can. So that's kind of our story. And we actually have Jessica and Lexi here in New Orleans so that they can experience, you know, a convention and, and get involved with the work component part. They meet people, they talk about the candles, you know, we're actually being interviewed by, you know, um, a, a magazine for this. So it's a great opportunity for them to really experience the full aspect of, of what work is. That's Does anybody have any questions or comments for Bonnie before she um, needs to leave? And she said she'll stay for a little bit, but I just wanted to give you all an opportunity. Uh, this is Sue Davis Killian. I was just wondering um, if Bonnie, if we could have your contact information to kind of keep in touch. Absolutely. It's uh, Bonnie at sensibility.org. If you could type that, Carrie. Yep, I'll put it in the chat. And feel free to call me. We'd love to meet with anybody and everybody. We're, we're very excited about this, obviously, as parents and as advocates. So we'd love to meet with anybody that is interested in talking to us. Great, thanks. Thank you. So I'm gonna head into where we were and I'm just gonna mute so um, you don't hear all the noise here. <laughs> thanks, Bonnie. All right. Very thanks. exciting. All right, and next up we have Blanca Deason. Blanca, hey, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you guys. Of course. Tell us about Sean and your journey and how it all began and where you're at now. Great. Yes, we do have a, my son, Sean Deason, he is a young man, 27 years old now, hard to believe. Um, we've been through the gamut, of course, um, but just a little history regarding our family. Um, Sean is my first child, 27, and he got diagnosed at age four and a half, almost five years old. We kind of knew there was something a little bit different about him, but being that he was my first child, I didn't really know exactly you know, what to expect. So it was mostly my mom who kept saying, uh, like around age three, that there was something that wasn't quite right. And um, so he got diagnosed and he, um, well, I guess when somebody tells you that your child has autism, back a long time ago, I didn't know anything about autism, to tell you the truth. I studied, I had my master's in psychology and really nobody, um, like their developmental disabilities was not really something that I studied at all. So I totally started investigating and I was basically in denial and in major depression for a long, long, long time. Um, finally, um, I don't know what happened to me, but I became like a warrior. I had, I think what, what happened was my daughter, Nicole was born. And um, I think, you know, just trying to look at my son, Sean, compared to Nicole, and just one day realizing that, you know, these both kids of mine are going to succeed, I think um, just made me have this turnaround. I quit my job. Uh, well, actually, I got recruited to the FBI. And so that kind of started um, all the assistance from the state of Florida. One of the pivotal moments was because I got transferred to go to training, um, I needed assistance. And somebody had told me about APD, med waiver services. And so we had put ourselves on the waiting list, but because it wasn't a crisis, um, you know, I didn't really know about the services. Fast forward a little bit, and then they transferred me over to uh, Virginia, and my husband was gonna stay on his own with my son. Finally, I got approval and that's when things started to happen. So I thank APD a lot. Um, we received behavioral, behavioral services intensive and, um, you know, Sean started flourishing um, with the one-on-one -on -one help. And he became basically my, my 
own like advocate. He wanted to be, you know, like a regular boy. Um, fast forward a little bit, of course, I, I don't know, some people know that I also became involved with APD. I started an agency assisting people with developmental disabilities and that kind of um, became my salvation. I learned everything and anything possible um, to assist my son. And so whenever I came back from the FBI, um, I started the agency and then um, I applied to go into this program called CDC, Consumer Directed Care. That helped us out a lot. It assisted Sean um, getting multiple services that he was not receiving, like therapeutic services for um, you know horse therapy and things like that. Well, regarding housing, you know, fast forward, Sean is like an awesome kid. He flourished with all the services that he received and it's multiple services. You guys all know about it. I mean, you know, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, equine therapy. We were nonstop, you know, our schedules were like every day we had to do certain things. Behavioral therapy, there were 40 hours. Um, gosh, back then, um, you know, we, we had to pay a lot, but I'm thankful that now Medicaid and MedWaiver are involved. Um, when he became 18 years old, um, I needed to find out what to do because he wanted to be just like his sister. His sister was going to move out. He wanted to, you know, have an independent kind of lifestyle. And so I also got divorced. And at that point in time, I needed to think about something out of the box for my son. Luckily, I was able to afford and we bought a town home that had um, two separate entrances. So right now, I mean, all the other speakers have something that is, you know, like a, a lot bigger than me. I'm just, you know, looking out for him. And it's just a townhouse that allows for um, either his workers to live upstairs because he still requires one-on-one uh, -on -one assistance. Little by little, obviously, we're trying to make him as independent as possible. So in the first floor, it's a separate entrance and he has his own apartment, his own laundry, his own, everything is all specifically done for him. And then second and third floor is kind of like a live-in situation. And so it just depends on whether um, we're gonna get staff to live there or um, like a family that uh, we could get, you know, I guess some sort of arrangement for him, for them to be able to kind of watch over him. Um, and that's basically it in, uh, in summary, what's been happening to um, our life. And Blanca, you being a support coordinator, you know, you know, different models and what other parents are doing. How did you come to decide that this would, this would work best for Sean? Well, Sean is basically, he's his own advocate. I don't know if uh, you guys know Sean, but he is very vocal and he wants to be, like he thinks he can be president of the United States. So I love that about him. He mm -hmm. just, um, you know, he thinks he can do it all. And so I, I want him to do it all. And so just having a small environment is what has worked for him. And even though he requires that one-on-one -on -one assistance, he doesn't think he does. So I kind of wanted to make it seem as though it's kind of like a natural environment for him. Um, I remarried, I moved out. And so um, I had to have, you know, um, a family in the second floor and they were amazing with Sean. It wasn't a staff kind of, but they kept, um, in touch with Sean. And so that worked out. Unfortunately, then COVID happened. And so I had to bring Sean with me and because I couldn't find staff to come in and out. Um, so it's always kind of like an evolving plan that I kind of have to always work out. I think, um, you know, we don't have a perfect system here in Florida. A lot of people really don't like the fact that we, you know, have just not a whole lot of services. But the services that we do have, 
you know, I'm very thankful. I'm still on the CDC plan, consumer directed care, and that has worked wonders for Sean and our family. So, um, and CDC is basically just, you know, hiring your own people um, using the state funding. Yes, and well, actually, so I'm no longer a support coordinator. I, um, I had to kind of quit. I, I told you guys I got remarried and being a support coordinator, state worker, Millery can vouch for this. You're always working. Like I always had my phone in the ear. So um, I left. Now I'm actually working for Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County. Um, I'm a social worker there doing the uh, guardianship program. So it's, you know, it's been working well for our family. And Sean is just the highlight of our, our entire family. We all kind of work together. And he is our, um, you New know, our, our central. Yeah, he is just, and he's amazing. Yeah, we all yeah. love him. Great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Does anybody have any questions for Blanca? All right, I'm sure there'll be questions. Thank you for Blanca. And um, well, uh, if you can stay around for a little bit. Uh, I can, I can for just a little bit. Sounds good. All right, Pam, you're up. Thank you for coming, Pam. Another warrior. I think warrior should be the title of this meeting for sure. Trailblazer and warrior. Um, why don't you tell us about your story with Andrew, Pam? Um, well, my name's Pam Minnelli, and one of the saddest days of my life was when Blanca decided she didn't want to be a support coordinator anymore because she was my son Andrew's support coordinator, and she was fabulous. Um, but we, you know. We've moved on, we've got another great support coordinator, but Blanca is, she's the bomb, I'll tell you. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen because I actually have a couple of slides to show you. Can you guys see my screen now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so this is my son, Andrew. Uh, he's 24 years old. As you can see, he's incredibly handsome. He has the most gorgeous blue eyes. Um, he is also nonverbal, has autism. He was diagnosed very young. Um, and we were very fortunate, like Blanca, we were able to get on MedWaver pretty early. So we've had a lot of services um, through his life. This is a picture of him at his graduation. He graduated from the Learning Academy in 2020, uh, which is on the ELS campus in Jupiter. And right in the midst of COVID, so his graduation was actually a drive-by graduation, which actually for Andrew was probably fine because he loves to be in the car. So he didn't have to get up and get on stage. So he was actually pretty happy with the whole thing. Um, so for the past two years since he's graduated, he attends the um, adult day training program at the L Center. And in 13 days on June 1st, he will be moving into a group home uh, called Babe's House. Um, it is also in Jupiter on Limestone Creek Road. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about how um, we got to working on and opening a group home for our son and uh, five of his uh, friends and peers. So my husband and I are parents. We've been very involved um, with Andrew's care, um, but we're, we're just parents. But we were able to, with the help of a lot of people, raise the money and, and build a home. Um, and uh, like I said, he'll be moving in in a couple of weeks. Uh, we, we've known for quite a while that he will need really 24-7 support. So the group home was really the we felt uh, the best option for him. Um, and so let me just take you through a couple of slides. I actually um, put this together for parents um, and I've shared it with a couple parents who are interested in doing something similar as well. So the first thing I tell parents is either form your own 501c3 or partner with an organization that is a nonprofit because if you're gonna raise money, people wanna be able to take the tax uh, donation. So um, do that first. I tell, we, we've started 501 C3s on LegalZoom. It's not that difficult. So um, that was probably the first thing folks need to take a look at. And secondly, 
take a look at what um, kind of home you want to build. Um, so uh, the name is Community Residential Home. That's the name that the, the state of Florida uses. There are standard homes. There are intensive behavioral homes. So you need to kind of look at you know, what your child needs, what his peers need, and make a decision on what kind of home um, you think you want to build. And then find some families, find some like-minded families who want to do something similar. Um, we have been very involved with the charter schools on the ELS campus, and they, um, we have a lottery system there. So you can't kind of pick and choose who goes into the school, but for a community residential home, you actually can, as long as the folks uh, qualify for APD services and for ResHab services you can kind of peer match and uh, join families together. So it is a nice um, kind of flexibility that's not there for all the services. Um, the maximum number of residents for CRH is six. Um, so that's the most number of unrelated people you can have living in a home together. So I have a lot of people say to us, well, what about eight or 12? We can't, that's not a CRH, that's a different kind of a zoning and it's not considered a community residential home. Uh, the first thing we started doing was looking for property. Uh, that was over five years ago. So this was not an overnight project that we, uh, we got involved in. Um, and the biggest thing I always tell people is, I've had people call me and say, hey, I'm gonna build a group home right next to your group home. And I'm like, you can't do that. There's a thousand foot rule. Um, that the state has that group homes have to be at least a thousand feet from each other. So if you're looking for property, um, you need to make sure that um, there isn't another group home within a thousand feet that's three football field uh, lengths away. And then check the zoning as well, make sure that the piece of property you're looking at is, is multifamily. Um, and then I would say, even before you have the land, you can start looking at the Florida Housing Finance Corporation uh, grant. You don't have to have the land yet. You can just basically say where the general area is that you're looking to put a group home in. Um, and it's, you know, it's just a si sizable amount of money. Um, when we got the grant, I don't know if it's increased or not, but it was um, $588,000 um, that we were able to get from the state to help um, with the group home. Now the group home, cost more than that to actually build, but that's pretty, uh, that's a pretty good start. And if you are able to get the grant, it's really great to be able to leverage that with other donors to say, hey, we've got this money committed from the state. Um, so we, we really are going to build this thing, you know, please come and, and join us and donate. So the next thing we had to do, um, actually, as we were getting ready to apply for the grant, you need to have a service provider. So if you're not a service provider, which we were not, um, we needed to partner with a provider who already provides residential habilitation services. And they need to have, they need to have been doing that for three years. That was one of the first mistakes we made. We partnered with a partner who we liked personally, we knew him, but he had only been running a group home for two years and that won't cut it with the state. It's gotta be three. Um, and then just keep working with your families, uh, keep fundraising. We did naming opportunities. Um, we had a donor who gave us a substantial donation and we named the house after her. her name's Babe, obviously. Um, but we had naming opportunities for every bedroom, um, for every, uh, for the great room, for um, the offices. So we got a lot of people who wanted to be involved and wanted to see their name as part of the home. And that worked you know, really well for us. Um, another mistake we made, <laughs> looking back, I wish um, we had gotten this advice is we, did a, we contracted with a builder before we got the grant. And then when we got the grant, we had to do a completely new contract because the grant is very specific about what needs to be in the contract with the builder. So um, make sure you, you do that. If you're considering applying for the grant and you've got a builder, maybe don't do the contract yet till you look at all the specs in the grant about what needs to be um, in that contract with the builder. We got a lot of local businesses that helped us um, along the way. Um, some of them did uh, donated product. Uh, we got our countertops donated. We got our, our, our trellises. Um, 
not trellises. Oh my God, my husband will kill me. <laughs> you know, the big things that go to the roof. Um, we got those at cost. So we had quite a number of people in the community um, who wanted to be involved and wanted to donate, not money, but services, you know, and, and product. Um, I think the biggest thing that we did right from the beginning, as soon as we bought the land, is my husband went around like with chocolate chip cookies and bagels to all the neighbors uh, and, you know, kind of, because sometimes still, you know, community may not understand what a CRH is, um, but I got to tell you, our neighbors are unbelievable. Um, before we we were able to open to the house, one night the lights came on, my our the lady across the street called us at like midnight. She said, I think somebody's in your house, which they were and It was just, but they look out. Our neighbors are looking out for the guys that are going to live in that home. And that's going to make it a really, uh, a really special place. So I'd encourage you to get, get to know your neighbors as, as soon as you buy the land. And I think it just make everything a lot easier for you. Um, this is another list of things and we don't need to go through all this because some of you on the phone actually may may know all of this but I just tell parents you're not you're not building you know a regular home um, there are a lot of things that you need to make sure are are in the home um, exit lighting actually fire you know fire suppression right now I believe the state of Florida for all new group homes requires a generator um, so as you're going through the grant and thinking about applying, really take the time to read through all the all the specifications, not just the ADA, but all the safety. Um, we put in um, an induction cooktop for safety. Our entire backyard is fenced, so the guys are free to kind of roam around in the back, but um, unless they have the gate code, you know, they're kind of contained within the back. We have an alarm system. So we did a lot of things. We also have cameras. Um, in the common areas, which again, you need a kind of a special uh, permission from APD to do that, but you can get that. And um, for us, that's, um, we think gonna be a really uh, interesting feature of, of our home. Um, the other thing we found out is your provider can only apply to the license for a license to APD after you get your certificate of occupancy. So it took us a while between the time we got the CO and then when the provider got the license. So just consider there's a there's a longer time frame in there. You know, just because you get the CO doesn't mean, okay, everyone's moving in tomorrow. It takes some time, you know, to get all the licensing and the inspections and everything ready to actually open. Um, we negotiated our lease, a lease with our provider. So uh, the autism project is basically owns the home. And uh, the Ark of Martin County is our res hat provider and we have a lease with them. So we're the landlord and they provide all the services. Um, and then right before you're ready to open, invite the community to be part of the home's activities. We had a housewarming, we're planning to do activities at the house, you know, once a month and we're gonna invite all our neighbors and really try to keep them as involved, in po as, involved as possible you know, with the guys in the home. So I started my presentation with a picture of Andrew. So I'll end with a couple. This is him um, at Els for Autism ADT. He's making orchid pots for Mother's Day. Um, and so we feel really, really lucky that um, he's in a he's in a meaningful day program during the day. Um, he's going to be um, living in the home. Um, it's going to be very hard for me. <laughs> Um, but I think it's going to uh, increase his independence and it's going to be long term for all of us, um, the best, the best solution for him and for his future. So does anybody have any questions for me? I have, I have a question. Encouragement. I have words of encouragement, Pam, you're going to be so happy and it's going to be great. <laughs> I Chris, hope so. <laughs> did someone have a question? Sorry, I, I wanted to pop in there. Did someone else have a question? I, ha I have a question. Is so someone from, is someone going to be living with them at the house? Like, so it's, uh, it's what's called a wake home. So there is staff um, during the day and on the weekends, but nobody, staff does not live there. So 
that we have overnight staff and that staff is awake. So if one of the guys gets up and needs some help or support, there's a staff person there um, to help them. So no, nobody, none of the staff lives there. They come, they come in, um, you know, in shifts during the day. And obviously there's more staff there on the weekends. During the week, the guys are expected to either to be in either in, uh, at their job or at an ADT, but to be kind of out and about like typical folks, you know, Monday through Friday. And then on the weekend, there'll be uh, more staff and there'll be um, planned activities um, for the guys. Okay, thank you. I have a question, it's Jennifer. Um, so this would be through the APD, they'd have to have um, in their budget for a res hab. Correct. Okay. Yes. This is Jean Malaco. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a quick question. I got lost when you're talking about someone being kind of the oversight to the home, but yet you're leasing it. I don't so understand. The, so the, the non-for-profit that um, raised the money and built the home is the Autism Project of Palm Beach County. So we're a 501c3 um, and we own the home, but the Autism Project rents the home to uh, the Arc of Martin County, who is the ResHab provider, and they provide all the services, they hire all the staff, they handle all the money. So we, the Autism Project, are basically just the landlord. So we're responsible for the physical you know, structure, but the Arc of Martin County has the license with APD to run the home, and they provide all the services in the home. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? I think so. Sounds pretty complicated. It, it's complicated. It's a thousand times more complicated than we thought it was going to be yeah. when we started. <laughs> and a lot of people said to us, I think Jack even said to us, um, building it is the easy part. And we were like, oh, no, but really it is. It, it's, the, it's, it's getting a provider that you're happy with and they're happy with you and, you know, the opening of the home. And then I'm sure you know, we've, we've been open since May 1st, so we've only been open 17 days. You know, there'll be a lot of uh, challenges, but hopefully, you know, a lot of positive successes as well. But it's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy undertaking, I would definitely say. And it took us five years. It, it was not something that, you know, we were able to just say, okay, we're going to build a group home and next year everybody's moving in. It took us five years. And just the paperwork alone is over overwhelming yeah the, the the grant while again it's a lot of money it is i've i've written some grants and done reporting in my day and it was definitely the the most uh intensive reporting that i've ever done did you use any of the roof funding at all i don't know what the roof funding is so no but i feel bad that i don't <laughs> <laughs> well there's lots of money there but but to get to it is uh, too complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, Anybody this, else? This is Sue. I have a couple questions. Um, how do you do meals? And what is the cost to the residents? OK, so I'm going to try to answer for Arc of Martin County because they run 16 group homes, so they're pros at this. But I, what I believe is um, they have a dietitian on staff and there's a um, menu that gets published for all the homes every weekend, uh, every week, excuse me. But um, there's also choice, obviously, for the residents. If they're making chicken and the resident doesn't eat chicken, my son's on a, a gluten-free, dairy-free diet. Um, so he's, his eating is very kind of restricted. There's a couple of other guys in the homes that are also on restricted diets. So in a way it's going to work out kind of good because, you know, they're going to be sort of limited, but I think, um, you know, it, it has to obviously be personalized for each, um, for each, um, resident, but at the same time, they have kind of published meals to make sure that you know, everybody's, nobody's gaining weight and everybody's kind of, you know, staying healthy, so. Great, thanks. I had a second question, but I forgot what it was already. Uh, the cost of-, of Oh, okay, so, so our, the ARC takes uh, ResHab uh, for the home. And then I believe that they also charge room and board to the residents, which is basically um, a portion of their 
their social security payment that they receive every month. And then part of that money um, is held for the residents. Um, and again, I don't know what that monthly number is, but if they need you know, cash to go to the movies or whatever, part of their social security is reserved for them in an account at the house that they can access those funds. So Mary, okay. Mary, Mary Ellen knows really what. <laughs> If I say something wrong, Mary Ellen, let me know. <laughs> you did a great job, Pam. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I just want to thank all the parents. If you look at the history of special ed, it was always the, the parents, particularly the moms, that really got things going for kids. If you look at all the way back to, you know, uh, um, the beginnings of IDEA and EHA, it was the moms. So thank you for what you're doing, um, all of you. It's very impressive. All right, and we'll have time at the end if you think of any questions for Pam or anybody else um, that has presented. Um, but now we'll move on to Jack. Thank you so much, Pam, for your presentation. That was, I know you very well, and we've talked about it so many times, but I, I learned more through your presentation. So um, there's so much information to be relayed. So I, I appreciate it. Um, and Jack, would you like me to present or are you going to present your PowerPoint there? Um, either way, I got to. I added some slides, so let okay, me go ahead. You can let present. Okay. And Jack Kosick, thank you for joining us, Jack. You're very welcome. Sure. And Jack's going to talk a little bit about um, his daughter Brittany, and I believe Brittany might be the the older of the participants. Right? Is Brittany in her thirties? Brittany's thirty eight. 38. Doesn't seem like it's possible, but she is. I know. She's young at heart. <laughs> Let me get back to the right. Here we go. Okay, I'm Jack Kosick. And uh, first and foremost, I'm a dad. Can I, how do I get it? So I'm, I'm can I move my screen over here? Here we go. Um, full transparency. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Noah's Ark and Noah's Landing. And I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of Noah's Ark and the former executive director of Noah's Ark and Noah's Landing. I've been separated from them for the last three and a half years and been doing some consulting for residential communities. But I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about them, but I'm not representing Noah's Ark or Noah's Landing. Um, the other thing is it's, it's really a tough act to follow with Bianca and Pam, you guys are doing great work and it is hard. You guys know it. It's it's 20 times harder. You said you were, Pam, you were working on it for five years. We've been a little bit over 20 years. And so we're sort of the trailblazer. We were the first community in, in Florida, in central Florida, to be to open up as a planned residential community. And it wasn't easy, as you probably can imagine. I want you to introduce you to my, the inspiration behind my perspiration. This is Brittany. Brittany's adopted. We adopted Brittany when she was 13 days old. And I have to say, she's the single biggest blessing of my life, period. We picked her up two days before Christmas in 1983, and she was in a little Christmas stocking. And she's been the, the joy of my life ever since. But like many parents, you know, your, your child goes and all of a sudden they're, as they're growing and developing, Brittany wasn't hitting her milestones. She wasn't babbling when she was supposed to. She wasn't, you know, turning over. She wasn't crawling and everything else. And we kept going back to the doctor and they said, Brittany's Hispanic. She'll catch up. Don't worry about it. You know, you just, just relax. But at 18 months old, the doctor sat us down one day and she he said, your daughter, and I hate, excuse the, the language and the terminology, your daughter is mildly mentally retarded. She'll never walk, she'll never talk. You guys just need to deal with it, learn how to deal with it, or make other arrangements. Your world stops, your focus stops, your priorities change. All of a sudden, Brittany came, became the the center of our family. We had a 12 year old that, that actually I guess sacrificed quite a bit because of all the attention Britain was getting. We went through all the therapies and all the things you have to, all the testing and all the battles with the school to get her services. And I, and I just need to say, well, 
at 18 years old, here's Brittany. She does talk, she sings karaoke, she dances, she water skis, and you can see on the left-hand side, this was her graduation day. She was with her best friend, her dad. So that sort of sets the stage of what my passion was and what I did, what I did. oops. Okay, but what we did, as I said, it, when Brittany was 13 years old, I looked at her future and said, what's gonna happen? Who's her friends gonna be? Where is she gonna live? What kind of quality of life she could have? And long and short of the story, I was in corporate America, America mid-level manager for a builder and developer. And I just, I just knew that it wasn't good enough from what I discovered looking into the, the, what was available for Brittany at the time. And at the time, there was a waiting list in Florida of 6,000 people. And we said, oh my God, we've got to do something. Well, that waiting list today is over 20,000. So we went ahead and we said, well, what are we going to do? We got, you know, we, 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 we got we to gotta do something. We just can't do the same thing. And I don't know, some of you are old enough. I see a little bit of gray hair out there. Y'all can probably remember the Andy Griffith show, the town of Mayberry where Andy Griffith grew up. Well, that's what we wanted to do. We said we wanted to do a community that would be like Mayberry. And we wanted to be able to say, okay, everybody's going to watch out for one another. So we sent out, we put an online survey and we had over 1,600 responses over a little bit over a four year period. And here's the, here's the top things that what families said they wanted in a community for their loved one. You can see that, not in, in, again, 1,600 responses. Personal safety was the number one concern. Recreational and social activities, transportation, daytime activities. If you notice, those are all in the 90% bracket, and then it drops down to living close to my friends. But that was still pretty high with three quarters of the people saying that. And then employment. There's a bunch of other things we had on the survey, but those are the ones we said, okay, we need to focus on that as we start to develop the master plan for the community. Plan communities, when we said we said we wanted to do this, oh boy, did we hit a nerve, okay? <laughs> you can't do that. The battle was absolutely brutal up in Tallahassee. You had people that wanted to do a community like that and, and we're a nonprofit, Nozark is a nonprofit. And, the realization of the whole thing, this was not certainly not profit driven and the, the numbers after you open up will prove that, but the battle was brutal. There was the people that said, okay, wait a minute, we're not gonna go back 50 years and, and start to build institutions. Here's what they were portraying that we were doing. And we actually had testimony up in, in, in Tallahassee when we went up there to try to get a law amended. It says, it's an institution, they called it a lockdown facilities. We're gonna have people laying and sleeping on the floor and we're gonna have people running down the street negative. It was awful, but we kept per persevering. And another said, well, it's gonna be like living in a projects. Uh, that's not what our vision was, but they never really took the time to understand what we said we wanted to build. We have an, had one of our residents and our first residence, this is Jeff. He lived in public housing and he was exploited. Jeff had a, he had a little job, part-time job, He'd work a few days a week and he had an old beat up pickup truck and his neighbor in the, in the housing project he lived at in plant city was talking to him one day says hey jeff why don't you get yourself a new truck and jeff his, their, his parents lived a couple hours away and he says well i don't have any money so well you can trade in your other your truck so jeff got the title to his old truck he, he says got a this guy said he had a friend at a car dealership took him down there jeff traded his car and got him a brand new pickup truck and he was proud as a peacock up until the time that he, he didn't understand it, he had to make payments. So one day Jeff hears noise, a noise outside his apartment. He goes and he, he sees, he's thinking somebody's messing with his truck. He goes out there, two guys jumped him and you can see what he did. And this is after he got cleaned up and they took the $1 bill that he had in his wallet. So public housing is certainly not a good choice in, in my opinion for our population. And then we talked to you, there's a reference earlier about when, when individuals hit 22 years of age, there's where the disconnect happens. And some of the parents that are online right now, that's in the future. And many times you don't really think about where's my son going to live or my daughter going to live because they get services. They're gone during the daytime, Monday through Friday, 
and the school is sort of taking care of them and helping them. But then it, the one day that comes and all of a sudden the, the yellow bus is not out by the curb. And you say, now what am I gonna do? What's, what's next? next? I'm, they become disconnected from their real friends and their classmates. So the burning question, oops. Well, I went all the way down, didn't I? Sorry. Hopeless. Best describes how many families with children with development disabilities feel. Because when you get to that point, you say, what's gonna happen? How is, how is, how is Brittany gonna live? Is she gonna have enough money? And up until recently, there's not been really good opportunities or not choices even for people to, as far as residential, not good choices. Letting go. Somebody made a reference a little bit earlier ago about letting go. And I could tell you, this was the hardest part, one of the hardest experiences you'll ever have. About the time Brittany turned 18, she started a transition class at Florida Southern College. And it was a, a specific class with 10 people, a teacher and a paraeducator, and it was integrated into the lifestyle of the college. Some of the two of the students took some audited some courses. They were they they could attend the, the, the meals there, they could attend the activities there, and they had the college a college kind of experience while they were learning independent living skills. Ann Landers. Ann Landers, I don't know. Can you, can you is is it is the copy being co covered a little bit there? It is? No, we could see it. It's okay. fine. Um this here. And she said a saying here is it's not what you do for your children, but what you have taught them to do for themselves that will make them successful human beings. I'm going to plead guilty because Brittany, when she turned 18 and she, she went to this college transition class that Noah's Ark facilitated, it was the first, first of its kind in Florida. And it was named, I think it was in 2006, the best special education program in the state. When you, you go and you say, hey, wait a minute, you know, um, Brittany, you didn't do your bed, or Brittany, you didn't do your laundry, or Brittany, you didn't do that. Many times it's just easier to do it yourself than to take the time to, to allow them to do it because it's just easier. So I was really guilty of that. But what where that really shows up is when that transition occurs and you're saying, okay, you're going to live independently now. And they haven't been taught how to how to do some stuff. One of the one of the things we had in one of the first homes we had is a, a flight attendant, a single mother had her son moving into our small community. We have two. And she says, Well, I don't know that Chris will this will work for Chris. He doesn't know how to cook and he, he doesn't know how to do laundry. And one of what, what turned out to be his future uh, roommates she said, Well, that's no problem. We can teach him to do that. So there's a dynamic that happens where they help each other out. Remember Mayberry, where people help each other out? That's what happens. We developed and we copied this, quite honestly, I don't want to take credit for it, but we copied this from the Ark of Jacksonville. And they, we printed it up at Noah's Landing or Noah's Ark. And it's a flip chart of the different things that, that you should be helping your child learn how to do in preparation for getting living independently or supported living. I think they still have some available. You may want to give them a call if you're interested. And it's it's it, there's all sorts of things about doing laundry, uh, stranger danger, everything that happens. And there's things that are in there that I probably can't do, but it's a good sort of a guide to be able to say, well, okay, now let's get ready for it. Promise and Brevard. There, there's a, a reference to Promise and Brevard. It's just up the road, up, up 95 from where you all are at. And Betsy Farmer was the former direct executive director there and co-founder or founder of the community, her and her son, Luke. It's a great community. This is the clubhouse. It's about 13,000 square feet. And it, they opened in 2017. And they've got about 125 residents. And they have three, let me see, I think. Here's the site plan. The community building is in the front. There's all sorts of activities and things for them to do. There's a, a place for optional dining, uh, act for arts and crafts. They have an art center. You name it, they have a video center. 
but then they have three apartment buildings and I think all three of them are three stories. But then in the center core is their activities. They've got a pool, a uh, fire pit, a barbecue area and everything else. It's quite impressive. If y'all haven't seen it, it would be great to go there. Uh, wonderful, wonderful community. Noah's Ark started much more humbly. We're 20 years, over just over 20 years in, to, to come into where we are today. And this is the beginning of it. This is the community. We, we, were, we didn't have two nickels to rub together, okay? And we started this out of the passion and I started it out of what's gonna happen for Brittany. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because I discovered there were so many Britneys out there. So we were looking to, to, to do a home and, and we we're working with somebody else in, in the First United Methodist Church, helping them out, somebody that wasn't associated with, with Noah's Ark. And the, the, the pastor said, well, what do you guys do? And I, we told him about how we advocated for people and for people with disabilities and, and the need. And he says, well, how many people? And I said, well, there's over 6,000 people in a waiting list. He said, well, I think it's time for the church to step up. You start talking about the faith community and we, Noah's Ark is in fact a faith-based community. This is a God-driven organization. And so the, the senior pastor says, well, and I'm a real estate broker. And I, matter of fact, I'm helping Bonnie and, and Denise with sensibilities locate some property. And I said, well, I found three lots right across the parking lot from the church. And I said, the guys, I, I negotiated a really good price for this thing, but Again, we didn't have any money. Three lots, infill lots. This is surrounded in the center of Lakeland, surrounded by homes in a great, great neighborhood. And the, the guy wanted $56,000, $56,000 for all three. And the preacher says, well, that's a really good price. He says, we need to buy them. And I says, well, okay, well, we can start some fundraising. You know the routine go and ask for money for specific things. And he says, no problem. The church is going to buy them and the church will donate the lots to you. There's an opportunity there. You start talking about finding land. Finding land is important on the front end of a development. So we went ahead and the church bought the property. Now I, I have a construction background. I, I designed the home. We had a, a, a designer go ahead and draw up the plans. And I was the construction superintendent. I didn't know I was going to be, but I, that's where it ended up. So the home on the left-hand side where it says phase one is the first home that we built. And the way we built that home was sort of interesting because the church bought the land. And I told Riley, the senior pastor, I said, Riley, you know, we got to raise some money to be able to, he says, well, here, he gives me a check for $25,000. He says, let's get started. And I says, okay, well, $25,000 doesn't build a home. But we use the same concept as um, Habitat for Humanity does, where you use volunteers to build it. The problem is you got people that come and show up that you have no clue what kind of abilities they have or don't have. But we went ahead and we started to do it and we started to get going and gave us 25,000. The Rotary Club kicked, it, kicked in some money. James Hardy Building Products. Those are the guys that do the concrete and fiberglass siding and trim that termites don't eat and everything else. They donated all the siding and all the trim for the house. We got people to donate to shingles, somebody else to donate the finishing of the concrete. And all of a sudden this became a community project. It took us nine months uh, working half days on Tuesdays and Thursdays and all day on Saturday using volunteer labor. Because we wanted to build one house because quite honestly, I have a real estate broker's license, but I've never done the property management card of this. And we didn't know how this was gonna work. How can, can, you, can people actually afford to pay their thing? So, and how do we charge rent? So what we did is HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development, says that an individual can pay 30 to somewhere around 30, 35% of their income and be affordable housing. So we took 30% or 35% of their income and SSI income, let's today it's it's 800 bucks, right at 800 bucks. And 30% of that is 240. So that's the rent. Where can you find any place to, to be able to rent? You know, it's, it's shared common area and you rent a room 
and each of the homes have four bedrooms. Okay, the red flags going up. Say, wait a minute, you can only have three. We'll go back to that in a second. So, but we found out that they paid their bills. They had enough money because we only charge them ridiculously low rent. They were able to afford that, plus be able to buy groceries, plus some to have some money for activities. And we're a nonprofit, so we're not driven by what's the bottom line of our profit and loss sheet. So we learned, and we worked on that for about five years, and we said, okay, we need to expand this thing because the house on the left-hand side is on one street. The house on the, the two houses on the right are on the next street. They shared a backyard. And so we said, well, okay, let's see if we can raise some money to go ahead and, and um, build a second home, maybe a second or third home. We found that there was a grant available through the Florida Housing actually had a grant available, but it was a, a loan, a low interest loan. But then remember the hurricanes that went through back in 2007 or 2008? We had three of them go through Polk County. So had, they had hurricane housing, housing recovery funds available. So we got a grant, a partial grant for the second and third home on the right-hand side. And then we raised the funds locally through the community and through donations. And James Hardy kicked in all the siding and trim again. And we built the, and then we, we went to the Builders Association of Polk County and said, hey, we need some help. And they said, well, what do you do and what do you need? And I knew some of the builders because I was a broker and sold some homes. And the guy says, I said, well, we'd like you to build a house. And they started laughing. They said, no, 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 really, what do you need? And I said, well, we'd love you to build a home. And he said, well, we don't have that kind of resources. Well, you don't maybe have that kind of resources, but you have contacts with the subcontractors and suppliers. And you know some of them that are philanthropic and willing to donate some stuff. He said, well, yeah, we do that. So they ended up building the second house and they did just built it with a partial grant, okay? And they got the, everything else was done through the Builders Association. There's a public private partnership. Even the people from Tallahassee Builders Association came down. Everybody wanted a piece of that action because we, all of a sudden now we got all sorts of publicity. So we built a second and third home. And then if you look in the center, there's a little green thing that says garage apartment. There's an alleyway back there. We built a two-story garage or garage with a second-story apartment. And there's a two-bedroom apartment there. So we've got a little, a little area there that is uh, uh, 14 bedrooms. We did a, and this is important, that we did a half court because they like to shoot hoops. So we put a half court basketball court in there. Well, they didn't play the basketball because it was too hot to get out there. They didn't want to get all sweaty. We put a garden in, we said, okay, we can grow our own fruits and vegetables. That's gonna be a great thing. We got these flower boxes and everything else. And they said, I, I don't wanna do that. It's, you know, they did it once or twice. They don't wanna get out there and get dirty. So that was a miserable failure. We put a gazebo in and they used the gazebo a lot, but we used that area frequently to do like barbecues and so on and so forth to engage other families, to get them together, to show them what supported look, housing looks like and then be, become part of our, our database. Land. There's currently six communities in Florida that are either under construction. There's one down south of Miami in Kendall with Casa Familia. I believe they're about to start construction here pretty soon. They're trying to work out some obstacles. Uh, Jacksonville, the Ark in Jacksonville, they did a great job in there. There's Quest, Quest Village in Orlando, Noah's Ark or Noah's Landing in Lakeland, a Promise in Brevard. There's one up there, I'm trying to think of the name of it, Independence Village, I think it is in Tallahassee. So because of the stuff that we did, we had to get a law amended, we had to get rules changed and everything else. It opened up the ability to do this thing. And once the people, we had terrible resistance through the Florida Developmental Disability Council saying, you're not gonna build, they'll build this, we'll, we'll fight you all the way until they saw it. And we were visited at Noah's Landing by all the agencies. We had APD, we had ACA, Children and Family Services. Um, there were six of them. And then the, the final people that came to see us were the disability rights people, the legal people. And they came down there with their checklist of, of what they call heightened scrutiny. Are we doing all the things necessary to make sure that the people in the community 
that live in the community have access to the greater community and they can participate. If you go back to that little thing that we talked about, the number one thing is safety. In this community, you see right here at the very, can you see my little, my, my thing scrolling okay? As you come in, you come into a turnaround roundabout. There's a gate here. It's not, it's not locked in. It's one of those little arm things. And quite honestly, you could drive around it if you tried. Okay. But it's that it's controlled access. So people at nighttime, the gates close. So people don't just can't come in and just snoop around unless they know the code or they're invited in. Meandering walk paths. Okay. Exercise. People need to have exercise because they have a tendency to, you know become couch potatoes sometimes. The public bus stop, transportation was one of those issues at the top, okay? Gazebos for, for socialization, a covered pavilion. We learned that the pavilion needed to be covered. We've got a basketball court there and they use it all the time for dances and karaoke and different things. And the center core of this thing is a clubhouse. Now we've built everything from this line to the right. That's all phase one. And this is phase two over here. In phase two, we want to we want to look at something. People from disability rights, when they came down, they were looking to find out what we're doing wrong. And quite honestly, we got two glowing reports from them. They said this is the best we've seen. And we looked at that, and I we were sitting in the little screen enclosure at the clubhouse, right about here, looking at this. And this is all a wooded area, and there's an open field. And the, the disability rights people, they wanted to drop by and just sort of visit. They were there for six and a half hours. So they weren't there just to, to visit. They were looking, okay. And so you start to establish a report. And I says, you know, the next thing that I'm concerned about, because you have people with Downs in particular that have early onset dementia and, and uh, Alzheimer's. So we need to sort of look to her future. I said, what happens? And, and Brittany, if you look right here is the house that I picked out for Brittany. And I took her there during construction. She says, no, 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 dad, no, no. Because there's a lake here and it's beautiful. You look out the her bedroom window, it's a beautiful lake. She says, I want to be at, right here, right next to the clubhouse. So Brittany lives right here, right next to the clubhouse. She has a two bedroom unit. And these homes, these apartments are one, two, three, and four bedroom. But it addresses all the things that we found in the, in the survey of what parents want. Okay. What does it look like? I should go back for just a second. If you look at this, the road system comes to the outside. Okay, there's one little short road here and there's a little road that comes up here. And we, this is a co-housing concept where the homes actually are turned backwards and the back of the home faces the roads and the fronts of the homes faces the courtyard. And so when you leave your home, you go into the courtyard and you walk down a meandering path to get to the clubhouse or the mailboxes. So that sort of facilitates crossing paths with your neighbor. And they're used, and then plus it's their walking paths, and they're used all the time. This is what it looks like when you're standing sort of at the clubhouse looking down one of the courthouses. And this is a pretty accurate rendering. It really has turned out really nice. And we've mixed homes where we have single family homes, some duplexes, triplexes, and stacked fourplexes and so they're all mixed together and but they're not like you, we didn't have a section that had single family homes where families of wealth could buy in or be over here and then people that maybe didn't have as much money lived in an apartment over here they're all mixed together again with the mayberry concept of neighbors helping neighbors that's the front of the clubhouse covered area you come up there and we've got four vehicles for transportation in addition, there's a bus stop. We worked for three years to get the Polk County Transportation Department to put a, a bus stop at our entrance. And I talked to Tom and the, the director of the, the transportation, and he said, Jack, we'll try it because there was a bus route just maybe a quarter of a mile down the road. He says, we'll try it, but you know, if it's not being used, we can't, we can't continue it. And it turns out that it was the, the most used bus stop on that route. Our guys, we did lessons on how to take public transportation. You know, we sort of did those kind of things to facilitate being able to have access to the greater community. And there's people there all the time. And there's one a, a one re, one block residential street that there's 25 houses on, and some of the people there take the bus to go to work. So instead of going across the highway to catch the bus, they come to our entrance and catch catch the bus. It really works out well. 
there's the pool area. People say, you really want to do a pool? Isn't that dangerous? If you look real close, it's a zero entry beach entry. So people with mobility issues can get in without having to have a lift to pick them up and pluck them down in the water. Um, and it's, it's, there's no, no lifeguard. This is a swim at your own risk, just like any other apartment complex. There's a sign posted with rules. And was it difficult at first? I was the executive director, okay? And we did, we moved 126 people in in 90 days and it was complete chaos. I wouldn't recommend that you do that. We only had a staff of eight people, but we did it, okay? We had, the contractor was behind getting the house done. The painter was in there doing paint touch-ups. The uh, furniture was being delivered. They had to put them in the center of the room because the paint, the walls were wet. The, the furniture was, or the moving trucks were coming in with, with the people's belongings. The people were trying to move in all 126 people. It was great. It was really incredible. You get to know the, fa the fabric of the people and you get the, the, the Mayberry thing where people were helping other people move in. It was incredible to see that. Socialization, they have parties there all the time. They have a, an activity schedule. We showed some people recently, we gave them a tour out there and they said, this looks like more of a country club kind of activity schedule than it does a community like, like a, a residential apartment. Here's a, sky, a view from the sky. Here's the clubhouse is here, okay? Brittany lives right here. <laughs> People come in, there's the turnaround, here's the pavilion, the pool and everything else. Interesting enough, we talk about nimbyism, not in my backyard. It's a concern, okay? One of the things we had to get, we had to get a law amended, we made reference to the thousand foot rule. We were able to get chapter 419 amended, took us two years to allow for more than one licensed facility. This is non-licensed. Everything we've done so far is non-licensed to get, because in the future, if we need to get something with elevated, like a group home or, or assisted living kind of home, it'll be licensed. And what, and the guy said, well, you have to have a thousand foot separation. Well, that would mean that we'd have one home way over here and another home way over here. And why that just didn't make any sense. And so we got the law amended that says in a planned residential community, you have to have certain criteria of eight acres or more. You can have more than one licensed facility next to each other. The thousand foot rule doesn't apply. So that took a lot of effort to get that done. Now, question came about cost. Now, and I'm not gonna to speak to cost for the other communities because they're all higher than Noah's Landing. Here's what it costs to live at Noah's Landing. The average rent to rent a room, because it's shared shared housing, is around $475 a month for the rent and includes utilities. There's a cable television and internet fee of 40 bucks, it's a little bundle package. And then there's a lifestyle enrichment fee. How do you pay for the staff to do the activities and stuff and supervise the activities? It's optional. That's a, that's a little bit difficult because Having it optional, if you people have got enough people that don't participate in that, then you don't have money for the staff to, to do enough like we wanted it to. But it's $235 and surprisingly, the overwhelming majority of people pay that fee. So it's about $750 a month on the living side. Then you need to look at groceries and dining. And I looked at two people that were, that I, I'm, um, Representative Payees for out there. They spend around $500 a month. We have a dining room, a large dining room with optional dining. And they do a, a Monday through Friday lunch and dinner. And the lunch is like five bucks. And the dinner for the people that pay the lifestyle enrichment fee, okay? The dinners are $7 and 50 cents. If, they're pay, if you're not paying the, the lifestyle enrichment fee, they're $9. But on average, people spend on probably on the high side, $500 a month. Plus they need some spending money. And that's, an, that's just, I took Brittany's and that's pretty generous. So if you looked at the two, you've got about $1,600 a month 
to live independently in supported living that does not include direct support services. That's all done by outside people through the Medicaid waiver or through private pay. I can tell you that uh, our friends down at the Casa Familia, they've put together, structured a program with an outside firm, an outside company to do services, um, sort of a bundled kind of services. And I think they're talking somewhere around get it right, $1,700 a month. That includes supported employment, uh, transportation, adult day training, or whatever they do, whatever that is, it's a, like a flat kind of fee. And that may vary just a little bit. That's it. I tried to talk as fast as did I do okay on time, Carrie? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a lot of information. Thank you, Jack, for sharing. Um, does anybody have any questions? We'll open it up for questions first. I think they fell asleep. <laughs> no. I have a question, Carrie. Go hey, ahead. Um, um, Jack, I think you said before how you were able to put four people in a unit because I thought only three were allowed for um, supported living. Yes, I did say that. Um, did you say how? I didn't remember <laughs> saying how. I didn't you tell you how. Okay. We built a four bedroom, four bed, the homes that Noah's Nest, our first little community, were four bedrooms and four bathrooms. Our idea was we didn't know the needs of the people moving in. Would they need overnight staff? Would somebody need a, a live-in? Would it, I mean, it was all uncertain. We were just learning. I mean, learning as we went. And there is a rule that says you cannot have, now listen to the wording, you cannot have more than three unrelated people with developmental and intellectual disabilities sharing a home. That doesn't mean you can have does you can't have somebody that doesn't have a disability living there. So for, for the first five years, we only rented out the three bedrooms where Brittany and her two roommates lived. And that third bedroom became an arts and crafts or just sort of a, a spare room that was very rarely used. We said, well, what are we doing that for? If we put somebody in there that is not, that does not have a developmental or intellectual disabilities, we're not violating the rule. So we went back and the AP looked at us and said, no, that it says three unrelated people with developmental intellectual disabilities. So we put a fourth person in there that does not have that kind of qualification or label. Okay, thank you. Okay. I cover everything that well, I don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, I guess from a, a state perspective now, Jack, you're working with a lot of families and a lot of organizations. Um, what have you seen the need to be? Are um, our families, I guess this is just kind of an open-ended question, but are families interested in planned communities? Is that kind of you know where you're seeing a lot of um, focus? Are, are they more interested in a smaller type of a, a project? What are you kind of seeing statewide, especially with your role um, at the state level? I think there's a mixture and this is, all three of the different approaches that we saw today are valid. You know, it just sort of depends on the individual's needs and their choice and what a family prefers to have. I, I see that if I were to do it again, it was it's difficult to do the as large a community as we did. We, we bit off a big, big rock. It was challenging. Uh, we, we didn't know what we didn't know. Um, and I think realistically something, I would probably make a, a, a smaller community, maybe 75 people. But we have people who we've got, Bonnie and, and, and Denise are looking at doing something on a, a different concept, concept than what we've done presented here today. And we're working with the APD now to make sure that it's going to be okay. And uh, so I think there's a synergism that happens where if you look at Noah's Landing, for example, and I don't wanna use the word clicks, but there's, there's neighbors. I mean, the neighbors, there's certain groups that, that sort of pal together and if you have a large enough population out there, 
you can find your niche in, within that. So I wouldn't be afraid to do anything size wise. It's harder to do the activities and the schedule and the socialization on a smaller scale and be able to afford it. Great point. Any other questions? Um, I, this is Sue uh, from the Down syndrome organization. Um, I, we definitely have a number of families in our organization that are interested in something like a Noah's Landing, very interested in what Bonnie has going on. Um, do we know if there's, um, besides for um, the ideal foundation, do we know if there's any other efforts to um, bring something like, you know, another larger planned community to Palm Beach County? or anyone who's interested in forming a group to work on it? <laughs> well, here's a couple of things. I, my, my note says, what can you do at the end? I was adding stuff to, to sort of polish up my presentation. Palm Beach County right now is pushing. There's a faith-based organization that's pushing because everything is driven by money, okay? If you don't have money available to you, and of the communities, the six communities that were built in Florida so far, Okay, five of them were property that was either donated or leased from the state, but there was some sort of public private partnership involved. I don't know of another one, another, I mean, the, the people in, that have been pushing this funding thing are going to looking for a referendum, I think, this fall for a half cent sales tax in Palm Beach County to be able to fund affordable housing. Their focus has been for the last two years, because I've been sort of in and out with that, th their focus is homeless. Okay, and there's a, there's a huge need, and I'm not gonna knock anything, knock anybody, because there's needs all over the place. But if you look, and I, the, the Florida Developmental Disability Council, gonna go back to a different story a little bit. They opposed us, Noah's Landing vehemently. I mean, they, the last day of the session of the first year, we were already approved, got approved by the Senate. We got on the floor of the House for a vote, and they got to one of the representatives down from your area to stop us because they kept asking questions and they finally tabled it because they didn't want to, they didn't understand this thing. It was moving too quickly for them. Right now, I've been working with an organization in Broward County and one in Palm Beach County, and we have two potential possibilities, one in each. The property cost is just crazy. That's where, that's where it's crazy. You need to look at, at what's available through the county. You need to look at what's available through the faith organizations. I was looking through, talking to somebody, the, the churches right now, there's a number of churches that are hurting and, and closed. There was a church in South Central Broward County it was owned by the First United Methodist Church in New Lauderdale. Is that is there New Lauderdale down that way? It's sold for about a million dollars less than what it should have. Okay. But they wanted to liquidate the property pretty quick. So the faith community is a good place. Our church got us started. And they, and they have in this organization. So you need to get behind that. And we can maybe filter through some information. How do you do that? The other part through the Developmental Disability Council, I got I, I objected to the fact that they were so unkind to us in their, their presentation when we we're trying to get the law amended. I mean, they said they referred to it, re referred to our community as a lockdown facility because it had a gate that goes down at night. How many people here live in a, in a gated community? Huh? No, 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 Mary Ellen, you live in a lockdown facility. I'm sorry to tell you that. Okay. So there, there was, it was awful, it really was. And we complained, we complained to the governor and the governor looked at it and I said, we said there was too many people on the Developmental Disability Council with younger children. It wasn't a representation, a fair representation of the broader need of our population. And at the time they had a, a, an executive director that was very difficult to work with. And so the governor took one third of the, of the members, about 11 people and terminated them, took them off the council, and he named, put, he put 11 people back, new people on there, and I got assigned to it, 
assigned to the Developmental Disability Council as a, an advocate, a parent advocate. Okay, I didn't have to go through the normal vetting process. Now, I referred to it back then. It's not the way it is now because a lot of things have changed, including the executive director. And there's openings, by the way, at the DD Council. They need, they need good people. I think they need one down your area. I referred to it at the time of being parachuted behind enemy lines because I was the only person on the council that supported planned communities. And whenever the topic would come up, you know, they'd say something and everybody would look at me saying, okay, what's Jeff gonna say about this thing? But they've changed a lot because they see one now. They're able to go to Promise and Brevard and Jacksonville and Noah's Landing and say, this isn't at all what we thought it was gonna be. It's not people running down the street naked. It's not anything at all. It's a pretty nice community. So I think there, there needs to be some more money. Money's the name of the game, getting it started. Florida housing was mentioned. They have the pre-development loan of 500,000 to 750,000. That's a good, because it costs a lot, a lot on the front end to get the development things done between your engineering, your architecture, permitting and everything else to get going. So if you can get a piece of property through government somehow or faith community, tie that into a, and they, it's, they say, so, well, you gotta get, it's a loan for three years and then you have to pay it back. But they'd never, if they've got a community, think about it differently. They have the funding control coming in, okay? So if they give you 500,000 or $750,000, and then you apply for funding to build the property, they've got a vested interest in that because they want their money back. And okay, they don't want to just to say, okay, we've made a bad loan and that they've never gone back to collect anything. So that's a great funding thing. Plus the counties, the local counties, I think the Miami-Dade has a, a, a tax that they do, they have a pot of money for affordable housing. One of the things that has to happen, and we did it with the DD Council, we got a great package of information. One of the things that has to happen is they have a, a, a five-year plan through the Housing Authority, Palm Beach Housing Authority, and whatever your local housing authority is, it may not be the municipality, it could be separate, okay? They have a five-year plan, and in the five-year plan they say, Here's the identified needs in the community. And they list, and, and don't crucify me because there's a lot of good causes. You know, veterans, I'm a veteran. Veterans need housing, battered women, people that are migrant farm workers, people that work for commercial fishing opera. I mean, they have a whole plethora, a list of people that are under the, the broad umbrella of special needs housing. Oh yeah and people with developmental disabilities. And it wasn't until we went up to Tallahassee that, 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 that people with developmental disabilities had a voice. We need to separate on the local plans in every county that there's a separate identity for special needs housing for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. If that gets into their five-year plan, okay, that means, and they have to submit, the housing authorities have to submit their five-year plan to Tallahassee, and it goes into a consolidated plan where all the housing authorities through the state put together, and then it goes up to, to DC, and they say, this is the needs of the greater community. If it gets into the five-year plan, they have to do something about it. I talked to, I can't, I'll take, can't remember the guy's name. The, the, they did a caper. The, it's an annual report about what they're doing. At the end of it, they'd open up for public comment. I says, have you ever done anything specifically for people with developmental disability count, disabilities? And there was a silence there for a little bit. He says, well, we have a special needs housing. Okay, well, that's the broad definition again. So if we can get that working collectively, and there's a beautiful package of information that's already been printed and ready to go to be presented and start to work on that. Yes, it's gonna take time, but your, your group home took five years. You know, So the realization of the whole thing is, it's, it's a long-term process. And yes, there's things we can do locally that will start to open up a, a, a broader flow of money because it all boils down to that. And do we know, is there anybody else in Palm Beach County working on this? Not I, that I, I'm aware of, not that I'm aware of. A, um, a couple of years ago, well, it had to be, two or three, because it was before the pandemic. Um, the ARC uh, the locally had 
um, a guy from the ARC in Jacksonville come down and do a presentation um, about the, you know, the ARC village in Jacksonville. And at the, that time, I know the ARC was talking about looking for land and they were trying to plan something. I have not heard anything since then because, you know, pandemic hit and everything came to a stop. So um, anyway, just I, I'm very interested in banding together with others to to make it happen here. Well, we have a, a, a and I can't really talk about specifics of it, but we have a very warm lead on some property in Palm Beach County in a great, great area. And who is we? I'm working with Bonnie and, and Denise oh, at Sensibilities. Okay. I've been working with them on and off for probably three and a half years, something like that. But okay. we're, they've got the Pulte Family Foundation behind them. Uh, and so I think things can happen. They're going to happen. It's just a matter, it's, it's a, there's a political thing that has to be taken care of. <laughs> That's all I can say. Well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'm going to be in touch with Bonnie. So, yeah, support yeah. them. Get get behind them and help them. And maybe we can orchestrate through them. I'm in Lakeland. It's 200 miles for me to drive from here down to there. Um, we can make this happen. We can we can get a community built. They, they're going to, the size of the property that we're talking about there, they'll, it's sizable enough that it, it's, of course, a planned residential community, according to chapter 419, has to be at least eight acres. So this property is in excess of eight acres. And they're talking about 16, maybe 16 people at first. Okay. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Can I ask a question, um, Jack? I had heard that um, and working with the housing and urban development, you you really need to have kind of a lead agency that helps. And and uh, I don't know if it was a presentation that I had that silo in many communities is one of those lead agencies. Is that your experience or? Well, I'm not sure that I understand the question. You have to have a lead agency. Have an agency that's working alongside with the housing and urban development and with the with families. That was the recommendation for a presentation that um, that I went to. HUD, I... HUD has money available, but they have different criteria for their funding. Okay. Okay. For example, the funding we had at NOAA's landing was through Florida Housing Finance Corporation. It was a low-income housing tax credit, very complex to do. We we hired an outside consultant to pull pull together the thing because the paperwork. You don't even want to know about it. It's, it's, it was, took a long, long time, very detailed. And in our funding, it says we have to have a minimum of 80% of our residents at Noah's Landing have to be diagnosed or labeled with an IDD. Okay. HUD basically has money available, and they, those ratios typically flip the other way, saying, yes, there's money available for people with disabilities, broader term. Okay but only 20% of those people can have that kind of di diagnosis. So they limit it to a, a much lower percentage. And then you go back and you say, well, sometimes you look at, don't crucify me if I, say, if I misspeak. Sometimes I, I, I'm not politically correct. There's sometimes our population being as vulnerable as they are, don't match up to people maybe that are also special needs coming out of prison, for example. And I'm not knocking anybody. Everybody needs a break. But the realization of the whole thing, we've seen some exploitation and some things happen at Noah's Landing. I mean, the learning curve for us was very steep. And we've been sharing it with anybody that wants to listen. So you have to be careful on how you approach it. Um, but And the guys up in Jacksonville have done a great job at their community. Jim, Jim Whitaker, I guess, was the guy that came down. That's it. Wonderful. Go ahead, Mary Ellen. No, I was just saying if there's anything that you need us to do, I know we're connected at CARD with Bonnie and um, um, 
and we'll reach out to her. But if there's anything that we can do to help support, um, we're happy to do that. They're going to need, you know, that's sort of the guidance I have that everything is triggered once you get, once you lock onto a piece of land. Because, for example, you go and you ask people, you can ask Florida Housing for some pre development money in a, in a generalized area, but then you got to go back and find some property. Give you an idea of, and, and again, I'm a real estate broker and I've been a real estate broker for, for years, a long time. Okay. And the realization of the whole thing is the property up in Polk County, you can buy a acre of commercially or appropriately zoned property up here for about a hundred to $120,000 an acre. It's open here in Broward County. And I've done extensive searches for property down there. You're looking at one, 1 million to $1.2 million per acre. If you have to buy the property and put it in top, and this is not a moneymaker, you, you, you can't really have a mortgage. The low income housing tax credits basically is a forgivable kind of mortgage. You can't have a mortgage if you're going to make this thing work. It's, it's, you're trading dollars. There's a little bit of margin in there, but not much. So you have to really, and, and Noah's Ark, when we did it, our goal was to develop a community that was safe and affordable. We wanted it, and, and, and don't take this wrong, to be able, the families of Joe the plumber, well, the plumbers make a lot of money, somebody else, okay, a blue collar worker to, to be able to afford to live in a community so you're not excluding them. There are nice communities, if families of wealth, there's, there's hundreds of nice communities across the United States. If anybody's got a lot of money, I'll be able to give you a list of where they are, but you're looking at on the low side of probably $3,500 a month. Who can afford, I, I couldn't afford that for Brittany. So, and where the Noah's Landing is the cheapest. I can tell you that. And I'm not trying to sell to anybody. I know it's a lady. <laughs> Brittany loves it though. She absolutely loves it there. Well, I want to thank um, Pam and Jack um, for you guys uh, for your presentations, along with Bonnie. I know she had to run, um, and also uh, Blanca had to run as well. But um, I hope that you all uh, learned of you know different types of supports for different um, you know support needs. Um, and we're inspired by these trailblazers um, in their journeys. Um, I'm sure that they have been trailblazers since day one. Um, and that's just to Mary Ellen's point, that's how it goes. You start with early intervention, school age, therapeutic, and that's just how your brain is wired. So um, I'm sure they're ready for a rest <laughs> at this point, maybe. <laughs> Um, but, um, but we are so thankful for them, uh, as an inspiration. And, and if anybody is interested in learning more, um, you're welcome to reach out to, to our panelists. Um, next month, I just wanted to do a plug. We are putting together another panel of, uh, self-advocates and our, our focus is going to be hidden disabilities. Um, so that's going to be very interesting. Um, and then potentially the following month, we'd like to, um, talk about serving those with, um, specific kinds of impairments, um, like, um, the deaf community, understanding the blind and visual impairment community, um, and really get a, a great understanding of their culture and how to better serve those communities. If anybody has any ideas of topics for future snack meetings, please let us know. I'm always um, welcome ideas and, and you guys are on the boots on the ground. So you know what uh, families are looking for and, and as service providers, uh, many of you, um, you know, are, are looking to connect. So please let me know if there's anything that you all are looking for. Um, so if there's no other questions, thanks. Thanks, Jack, you put your contact information in there. Um, we thank you all for attending and have a great month. Have a wonderful one, thank you. Bye, thank you guys. Thank you.